Marriage Champions, I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer for the Marriage Initiative. I'm delighted to introduce you to Justin and Tricia Davis, pastors, podcasters, and marriage coaches. The Davises founded Refine Us Ministry to help couples struggling with broken trust restore hope and renew purpose in their marriage based on their journey of restoration. They wrote, Beyond Ordinary, When a Good Marriage Isn't Good Enough, newly released, being real is greater than being perfect and personally coach couples struggling with betrayal. Refine Us offers online courses to enrich connection for couples, as well as their ministry, coaching couples individually and leading two in-person marriage retreats in Nashville. They also created an online devotional called Mentor Us, where couples receive a weekly email from the Davises with scripture, practical application and discussion questions, monthly membership programs and virtual community to improve and grow marriages. Justin and Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Excited to be here. That was like the best intro we've ever received. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I try to be thorough and to give our marriage champions kind of an idea of who they're going to be talking to. Absolutely. Because it's really important that they know, you know, who our guests are. So yes, thank you. Any, anyway, well, your your whole ministry, your refined us ministry, was birthed out of your story. You had had been at pastors and in leadership, but that basically your whole journey now is based on your story. So will you share a little bit and, and kind of get us where you where where you are now from where you came from? Yeah, Justin and I have been married for 28 years now, which is crazy. We got married when we were 12, but uh, we, <laughs> hey, we're right here. We're we're right old. Here. I'm right here with you. Yeah. We got married really young and uh, had our first baby five days after our first year anniversary and dove headfirst into ministry. And really when Justin and I met, we met in college and we fell in love with each other and we fell in love with the local church and the thought of really dedicating our whole adult life to serving in, in, in the local church. And so that's what we did. Um, we were in youth ministry for seven years, and then we planted our first church in 2001, Two. 2002. And when we planted, this was like before, like that word planting a church was, you would, we would tell people we're planting a church and they were like, is that a denomination? Like, what does that mean? And uh, so it was a very unique experience for us. And we were young. We had two young boys, one on the way. And we planted this church. And it it was incredible. In fact, statistically, at that time, churches that launched the way that we did um, had an 80% failure rate. And so the fact that we were in our late 20s, had small kids and had this brand new church plant. We always joke that our first weekend we had 12 people. And we were, Justin, what do you always say about like 12 people, 12 disciples? It's biblical. Yeah. <laughs> over the next three years, um, our church grew from our little family to over 700 people. And it was from the outside looking in, we were the poster uh, children of what it meant to be married and in ministry and parenting. But what people didn't see behind closed doors, and I think Justin and I were slow to even recognize ourselves, is that we were really great ministry partners, but we were horrible marriage partners. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that aspect of planning the church and really just pursuing ministry success, you know, I was a college athlete and kind of transferred goal setting and being driven and and succeeding and accomplishing goals and, and used ministry as a place to find validation, to find uh, self-esteem and self-worth yeah. and really developed my giftedness and neglected my character mm -hmm. in the first 10 years of our marriage. And, and all of that culminated on October 9th, 2005, when I came home from church and told Trish that I was leaving her and having an affair with her best friend and everything imploded right our, our our life our our family our, our ministry all of the dreams that we had and really you know nobody just does that in one choice there were several you know smaller choices of betrayal and infidelity that led to that decision and and so we obviously um our, our marriage basically ended we were separated for two and a half months um, we, we didn't talk for the first 10 days. I obviously resigned as pastor of the church and, and over that 
first 10 days of our separation, God began to break my heart for our marriage again and didn't know if I was going to get a second chance. And so I started going to counseling by myself. And mm -hmm. then 10 days into our separation, Trisha texted or called me actually and said, I hear you've been going to counseling. I said, yes. She said, well, I'm willing to go with you. Yeah. And quite honestly, I'd never done counseling before. You know, I, I was a pastor. I, I didn't go to counseling. I did counseling. And so there was a level of pride and probably more insecurity that I had around getting marriage help at that time. But God began to use those counseling sessions to bring restoration to our heart and to our relationship. You said that you were committed. You actually went to counseling four days a week for quite some yeah, time. For, 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 for two months. Yeah. We yeah. would have gone five, but he was closed on Fridays. But like <laughs> when the doors were opened, we were there. And, and quite honestly, you know, for couples who are maybe new to counseling or there's so much unspoken expectation. And we just thought, you know, a, a month in that our marriage was going to be fixed. Justin was going to move home, but it really took us 30 days for us to hit rock bottom, even in the context of counseling. Like when you live with dysfunctional layers for so long that have gone unintended, it takes time. And so 30, you know, days into counseling, um, we were in this really tender place where the counselor was like, you know, you know, for me personally, I'm starting to believe that Justin's trying to be a truthful person. And he's like, if you've left anything out, now's the time to share it. And I really thought that he was going to say, you know, no, I, I, I've told you everything, but it ended up being one of the most crucial, pivotal and soul crushing moments in, in our marriage to this day. I just, I just confessed to Trish that I had struggled with pornography for the first 10 years of our marriage and had not admitted it and that I was sexually abused when I was a kid and, and never gotten help for it and never talked to anyone about it. And obviously there were levels of, of truth that were needed, but it didn't take away the hurt and the pain that the truth caused, right? And so that really became the starting line of our restoration um, and a two-year process of rebuilding trust. And, um, you know, we never anticipated that was in 2000 and uh six six, six yeah. yeah so we, we never anticipated um you know all these years later doing marriage coaching and, and helping couples who are in crisis but no. that's how god works right he takes mm -hmm. the pain of our of our you know past and he leverages it to help other people and and so that's really what we try to be faithful with you know over the last you know 12 to 15 years well you had said when we talked that rock bottom is still a place to stand Mm -hmm. and that God brought you up from there. And you, I mean, one of the things, I mean, this didn't just implode your marriage. It imploded your whole career. Yeah. You know, you, and you had to stop being a pastor and do something else. And, um, you know, as you're rebuilding your, your marriage, you're also trying to find another career. But then yeah. God wooed you back to the place <laughs> that you are now with, with yeah. Dave. And, you, know, like, you say wooed, of, we sometimes say manipulated. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> like our counselor, if you would have said, you know, you guys need to stand on a bridge on a Wednesday at noon to find healing in your marriage, we would have been like, okay, we got you. We're going to do it. And he, you know, said it would probably be healthy for the church, the community that you lived in um, for you guys to move from it. And so we like moved 30 minutes away on the other side of uh, the north side of Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'll never forget, we bought a house and across the street was this white church that looked like a like a like an Amazon warehouse. It was a box church. And we were like, whatever. And really, we thought we're going to go. So we're not like awful parents and our kids are at least going to church and just God in his kindness used that small little community to just love us back to Jesus. No, no strings attached, no desire to share our ministry. They just loved us. I remember uh, a specific Sunday, we had gone maybe three or four weeks to the church. And this is before social media, Facebook didn't even really exist how it does now. So there was really no relational connection. And um, the pastor kind of came up to me at the back of the auditorium and put his arm around me. And he said, you must be Justin. And and I said, how did you know? He's like, well, 
someone told me that the former pastor of Genesis Church was attending our church, and you and Trish are the only ones that cry through every service. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, kind of, I just put it together. I'm like, well, that's good. But, you know, that really, you know, birthed just a friendship. And it was really the first time in our marriage relationship that we had relationships, not because we were pastors, but just because people wanted to get to know us. And there was a healing aspect to that. Um, and you, you mentioned, you know, I started a new career and never, ever thought I had never seen growing up anyone be restored back into ministry after moral failure. So mm -hmm. I didn't even think it was possible. Um, or and then so that really I didn't have that desire in my heart. I, I had a, a longing for it and a missing for it. But... And you won't say this, but he was crushing his new career. Like there was this thing called a president's club trip. We don't have those in ministry. And so he won it. And I remember we were sitting on the beach in this very warm, tropical, beautiful place. And I said to Justin, cheers to never going back into ministry. Like that, <laughs> that is how far gone we were and not in a um we don't love you god but just in a like yeah i just felt like i was damaged goods and yeah, we, yeah. We, we, had we, ruined, we, we had ruined our our oh. chance right yeah. i had ruined i had ruined the opportunity we had to be called in the ministry and and thankfully you know god had other plans he surrounded us with several people mm -hmm. along the way over the next couple of years that you know offered opportunities of restoration and off opportunities of you know reconciliation with some of the people that I had hurt at our former church and, and really what walked us through a process of, um, you know, being restored back into ministry. And then they asked you to share your story. And you yeah. Another <laughs> local pastor. It was like, these churches were out for us. And, um, this local pastor was, he had just been on staff for, you know, six months and learned of our story and, he just met with us and said, Hey, would you be willing to share your story at our church? And I was like, Oh, absolutely not. Like, no. And he's like, well, will you pray about it? And I was like, Oh man, don't play the, the, you know, pastor card on me. I, I, I've heard that before. Yeah. yeah I, I just said, no. And what was so cool in what I loved about this pastor's leadership is he received that no with kindness. And he just gave me room. And over the next couple of months, I just felt like God was saying, just, just trust me. And so I told God, I told Justin, and I told the pastor, I will share our story one time and one time only. And, and that is it. And so we did. And when I say we shared our story, I think we sobbed through the whole interview um, of the pastor just walking us through. But what happened after was really like a book, the book of Acts type moment. We got done speaking and people stayed. Like for hours, they stayed to talk to us. And I kept looking at Justin going, did they not hear the story we just told? Because we really truly are now the poster children of how not to be married. But what I didn't understand at the time is that I had the gift of God's redemption in my story. And I had to make a choice if I was going to bury it or if I was going to do something with it. And that really was the launch of um, Refinus Ministries and really our heart behind coming alongside couples to help them restore hope and renew their relationship. Oh, which is just such a beautiful story of how you do that. And then you wrote a blog, The Eight Things That Destroyed Our Marriage. Yes. That is still very, it's still out there. It's still very relevant. <laughs> it's, and, it's crazy, you know, that we, we launched the blog in February of 2009 out of a response. We spoke at the church in January of 2009, mm -hmm. and we didn't know how to not meet with hundreds of people all the time. You know what I mean? Um and so that was really kind of a, a organic response to us trying to help as many people as possible. And we still get emails from people. I saw this blog post that you did, or my friend sent you this blog post that you guys did. And, and that's really cool. Just how God uses that. And, um, and then that kind of became a passion of ours of we, you know, back when blogging was a thing. So from like 2009 to 2014 or 15, we, you know, would write, very regularly on our blog, refineus.org. And, and that then became an opportunity to, to write beyond ordinary when a good marriage just isn't good enough. Yeah. Which yeah. is, which is so helpful. I love too, how you are so honest about your journey 
a forgiveness when trust is broken. And 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 one thing, you know, that you really mentioned, Trisha, was the way you, you know, of course, you know, they're, they're the offender and the offend the offendee and 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 everyone kind of has a different role and different ways to forgive and different ways things that need to be forgiven, but just letting people having a being a model for people that you're not mm -hmm. you're not a sucker because you forgive could you talk about right. that because i think that's where people really struggle thinking if mm -hmm. i forgive then i'm the stupid one uh, mm -hmm. absolutely and yeah. i think that it you just put it in a in a phrase that most people who have had um, trust broken in their marriage, say that very thing. And I think it begins um, with making clear the difference between forgiveness and trust. Oftentimes as Christ followers, forgiveness kind of blankets all of all of that, but forgiveness is free, trust is earned. Yeah. And so that's, trust is kind of a whole different conversation, but the beauty of forgiveness is that you can choose to forgive regardless of how the person responds yeah because it's what jesus did for us he he chose us he forgave us regardless if we received it but it begins with um just that gut level raw honesty of saying i've been wounded like this really happened to me this this is really my life and out of that you know confession is the grief and grief, you know, you can read there's multiple stages of grief, but there's probably there is way more than just seven. And it's not linear. It can be all over the place. But one aspect of grief that I think trips many of us up in the process of forgiveness is anger, mm -hmm. because becoming angry feels sinful. And there is rageful anger um, that has a malice you know, tone to it, but righteous anger in the context of forgiveness says something happened that was wrong that needs to be made right. Yeah. Like this was wrong. And so then I get to choose, am I going to be bitter? Which I think, let's be honest, bitterness gets a little bit of a bad rap because it, it oftentimes is like a safety net. Like I'm just going to be, we convince ourselves, I'm just be a little bitter. And really what happens is we build this wall of bitterness that becomes our own prison and we miss out on the life that god has for us and the truth is bitterness always lends itself to resentment and then that resentment spills over into other relationships so i think those are kind of natural tendencies we go to the i think we struggle with well then what else is there to choose yeah in the in the choice comes through the cross it's this posture of brokenness it's this posture of saying i'm willing to let go in releasing what was done to me to determine my future, to determine how I get to move forward. And, it, and it's hard because forgiveness feels like a get out of jail free card. Yes. But forgiveness doesn't excuse what happened to you. It prevents what happened to you from destroying your heart. It's, it's a releasing. And then what follows is the possibility of trust and the possibility of healing through counseling or through, you know, doing the hard work of love. But forgiveness is often looked at the finish line, but forgiveness is the starting line. That is just so beautifully said and such an invitation. I mean, you know, because because too, Justin, you had forgiveness to do for 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 things that happened in your past. It's not just right. it's not just one thing or the other thing or one person or the other person. Right. It's but just by making I mean, you make it sound like there's a possibility. And 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 I sure marriage champions, as you are as you are listening to the Davises and you can just hear that that opening the door to hope for the yeah. couples that you work with. I just, and you do, you offer your online courses. Mm -hmm. You do, um, you do uh, your, your marriage retreats that twice a year. Yeah. Um, there are lots of ways our marriage champions can, can yeah, get absolutely. with you as you come alongside. And then you do your one-on-ones too, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, forgiveness from my standpoint, you know, shame is, a great inhibitor of spiritual growth, right? And so when you've made a mistake and you've acknowledged that mistake, 
sometimes it's not easy to accept or live in the forgiveness that Christ offers or that your spouse is offering. And so helping people understand, well, you don't have to stay in the cycle of shame because intimacy can't be built there. You can receive forgiveness and you can forgive yourself. And it doesn't mean that what you did was okay. It just means that, you know, your past doesn't define you if you allow it to teach you, right? And so you can leverage your past to actually be a different person in the future. And, and so that's what, you know, I, I hope to, and that's one of the things that Trish and I really um, want to bring into the marriage spaces. You get both perspectives, right? You don't get um, just a female perspective or male perspective. You don't just get, you know, a person who's had trust broken or has broken trust. We hope to bring a holistic aspect into that conversation so that, you know, couples can find hope and healing from wherever perspective they're coming from. And you said too, that, that sometimes, you know, a couple will be on a session with you and they both really want to get to the same place, mm -hmm. but they just can't get there together without somebody helping them get there. You know, she, mm -hmm. you know, the, somebody may be struggling with not being able to trust. The other one's like, well, how long is it going to take? They both want to, you know, you can help them leap that hurdle you know, even just by your own example, like I know Trish, right. said, I can help her say it. It's okay to trust again. If, if, if mm -hmm. they if the trust has been earned just to yeah. just release them from feeling that I don't want to be duped again thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I like to think of it as um, a, a mountain experience. Sometimes you have to go like around the mountain to continue to go up the mountain. And in, in the healing process for the person that's been betrayed and the person that has betrayed, oftentimes it takes you in two different directions, but it's trusting God that the direction will eventually bring you back around together. Um, but sometimes the separation feels like we're not doing it right. And, and it, it, it's just and everybody's journey is different. It's as unique as our fingerprint and how God created us. There will be aspects of your story that they're able to forgive freely, but they don't, they're not able to trust or vice versa. So there's just, it has to be, I think Justin, you say it um, so well, just like a, it has, there has to be a space of grace in the trying. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one, one aspect of this is, we're on different journeys together, right? And that's, that's what's so complicated mm -hmm. because when, when trust has been broken in a relationship, the person you love the most that you would count on to help bring healing into your life is the person that's wounded you the deepest. Yeah. And so there's a, just this complexity to that relationship that, you know, I think a lot of couples want, you know, using the mountain illustration, they want to march right up the mountain. But if you've been to Pikes Peak or you've been anywhere you know, greater than, you know, the foothills of, of Nashville, Tennessee or whatever, you, you know that there's a winding aspect to it and it can, it can feel daunting and it can feel discouraging of like, why is this taking so long? But I think our hope is that we don't want to help couples have an improved version of their old marriage. We want them to help, de we want to help develop a brand new marriage in their life. Yeah. Right. And, and so that takes work. It takes intentionality. It takes time. And it also, takes a lot of grace from God, from each other, um, that, and grace is different than enabling, right? You're not, it's not an encouragement to enable your spouse for dysfunctional behavior. It's um, forgiving your spouse um, and allowing that grace that God has poured into your life to create something new in your marriage. I love that. And you know, too, even from the beginning, when you talked about getting to that bottom level of truth, that truth and authenticity are really, <laughs> as you were so gracious to, to transparently share your story with, you know, whoever in the, in the world, you know, for God's glory and, and, and for restoration, that's kind of where you guys are, are, have, have stood now is on truth and authenticity. Your latest book you published in 2023, being yeah. real is greater than being perfect. And you talked about how you were able to change and learn to just stand on that truth. Yeah, I think that's a frustrating thing for a lot of followers of Christ is we we give an, a, a lot of effort for transformation, but we don't necessarily see the fruits of that. So a lot of people are going to church. A lot of people are 
engaging in spiritual disciplines, but they still struggle with the same temptation, the same sin or the same insecurity or fear or, you know, anxiety or whatever it is that keeps us from being all that God has created us to be. And there's two responses to that. We can become discouraged and exhausted by trying harder, Mm. or we can just give up trying and pretend to be more spiritual than we really are. And, and, and so you have a lot of inauthentic followers of Christ desiring authenticity, but not knowing how to experience it. And so the, the book being real is greater than being perfect is really, um, hopefully gives, it gives space and it gives words to that, um, desire and also a clear path for us to experience this idea that it's transparency, it's honesty, it's authenticity that actually leads to the transformation that we deeply desire. And that's, that's intimidating. Um, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. What he conveniently left out is it will probably make you miserable first. (laughs) Right. But, but short-term misery for long-term change is a trade worth making. And Tricia, you had said then even too, that Jesus only heals the parts of the heart. Can you say that he doesn't force our transformation on us? Right. I think you, you say, (laughs) Jesse probably says it better than I do. Uh, Jesus only heals the parts of our heart we're willing to give to him. Yeah. And he doesn't force uh, himself into our transformation. Like we, we have to choose it. And I think Justin so beautifully said, there's two parts of that. Sometimes we don't even know that that is a choice that we get to have a say that our past doesn't get to define us. And then the other half is there has to be a commitment or a willingness to, you know, what I love about Justin's book is it's really his, I, I mean, we're, we're writing another book as we speak, but like that book is his, his life message. We have watched him as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a son, like walk that out. And so he knows the level of um, just the humble side of it. There, there's not to be humiliated, but there's a humili- uh, humility humility that comes with choosing that path. But on the flip side of it is just this life of freedom. And so if you were going to tell me that we are living our best life, you know, 28 years into marriage with all that we've been through and not just the affair, just a lot of life events. We say that that marriage is almost like fine wine. It just gets better over time when we choose to live in our authentic selves and figure out the dance of uh, grace and forgiveness and truth and trust is like, it's not a one time event. Uh, We will keep journeying on the mountain together until heaven calls us home. And that is both exciting and kind of like, oh, okay. Wow. Okay. There's, there's no Mecca on this side uh, of heaven. But I love that. I mean, and what an encouragement for our marriage champions who, as they think about their own marriages, they may be in all different ages and stages, but thinking of the destination and, and we don't have to get too deeply in it, but you had some life challenges a couple of years ago and the way that you reacted to those pulling together because you were in such a different place that you were able to live out just like you said in the book you were able to live out because you had already been living in trust and authenticity and practicing everything that you're telling your your people you counsel in your marriage you were able when you know some rock the boat kind of things hit you were able to do what you what every marriage champion and what every couple would would wish that they could do to turn to each other and move forward with each other and God. Yeah. yeah and I think that's, that's the, the hardest part of marriage, right? Like when we do feel wounded and even not even by our spouse, yeah. it's easy to project those wounds or that pain onto the person we love the most because they have the greatest proximity to us. And so, you know, I think for, for many marriages, sometimes the problems that they experience in their relationship may not even involve their spouse. It's more of unhealed hurts or wounds that have been taken root and it's taken out on their spouse. And so the experience that Trish and I went through a couple years ago, we were both wounded by other family members, but because we knew who we were in Christ and we had paved, you know, so many roads of redemption in our own story, we were able to, to find each other 
and walk with each other rather than making the other person the enemy mm-hmm. in, in that process. And it's hard to do, right? Because, um, you know, it, it, it isn't always clean. Sometimes it's really messy. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, Jesus shows up in our mess and, and can turn our mess into our message. I think that's a Craig Rochelle thing. I didn't make that up. Um, but I think that's the opportunity that we have as followers of Christ is, you know, it's not some things that God uses for our good. It's all things that he uses for our good and for his glory. Well, you guys have such an important and powerful message and and it is as authentic and real and inspirational as your resources are. So very oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. You yeah, Mary Champions, you've had a treat today. So just really glad you guys could show up and, and share this with us. Oh, thank you. Amy. Thank you. And Mary Champions, if you'd like to find out more about the Davises, you can always look for us at marriageinitiative.org. Thank you.